excited. I'll just go over a few of the housekeeping details. Um, but first, I want to say welcome. Welcome to an opportunity <laughs> for conversation to ask some questions and have uh, a bit of a discussion um, around COVID-19 um, and Vermont's responses um, to early childhood educators and education programs. Um, so um, I'm Brenda Metzler. I work with Let's Grow Kids as a community and program support specialist. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Chris Nelson, who is also um, a, a community program support specialist with Let's Grow Kids. And we are joined by um, Sharon Lee and Sally from the Vermont Department of Health. So they'll be um, presenting and answering questions. And um, I think, let's see, what other housekeeping things do we have? Oh yes, for best sound quality, um, you are all muted and we really do want your questions. That's what this is all about. So please use the Q&A box to ask questions and um, both Chris and I will help to facilitate them as Sharon Lee and Sally present. Um, they may see things pop up, but if they don't, we'll, um, if we don't get to your question right away, don't worry, we've, we've captured it. Um, also, this presentation is recorded. It's being recorded right now, and we will post it on the LGK website after uh, it is finished. All right. So let's hand it over. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you all for being here and taking time out of your extremely busy days. Um, I will introduce myself. I'm Sharon Lee Treffrey. I'm the state school nurse consultant, um, but I did childcare in my home as a registered provider for 10 years. Um, and I was a school nurse for 18 years in schools and so a total of 25 years in school nursing. Um, so I have a little sense of what you're up to with the snot and the food and the fun and the play and all of that and uh, managing. Sally, would you like to introduce yeah. yourself? Yeah, thank you, Sharon Lee. And I'm Sally Kirshner. I'm a nurse also. I work with Sharon Lee and I've worked in the health department many, many years. And uh, when it's not a pandemic going on, I work in injury prevention. Great. So. So this is a public meeting. Um, I don't, if you are a uh, reporter, we ask that you um, identify yourself and give priority to the child care participants for any uh, questions that they have. In case we run out of time and there's always a lot of questions, um, you can always call us at the warm line and that information is at the end of the slide. Um, I'm a little curious if you'd like to add in your, uh, the Q&A box, how many of you serve ch school age children as well as um, preschool uh, birth to three. Um, and I also have a question if you would indicate, um, excuse me, whether you use texting as your primary mode of communication or phone calling um, as your personal way of communicating. It'll come up later at the end of the slide, you'll see why. Um, and if people want to uh, uh, list the areas that you represent. I'm interested as to the spread of um, folks here at the meeting. So Sally, you're so good at this. <laughs> <laughs> well, just want to say thanks, as it says, thanks to everyone for everything you're doing, all your um, thoughtful approach and comprehensive approaches to keeping the kids safe and your and your staff and the other workers. We were talking before we got on the call about how effective that has been. That yes, there have been some cases associated with child cares, uh, but the fact we were just kind of half joking, the fact that the governor stood up and had a new executive order, but he is, um, consciously, intentionally promoting that schools and child care stay open, that means he thinks they're safe. And that's a good place for kids to be right now. So you all deserve a lot of praise and acknowledgement that the governor can, can feel that way in a true way and can stand up and, and say, we shouldn't be getting together for Thanksgiving and social events, but it's okay to send your child to child care. So thank you. And Sally and I'll pinch hit on this. Um, the Sally, do you want to start? Um, these are the um, 
on our website, uh, you know, everything's on our website is pretty impressive, I think, for the folks here at the health department who are putting our web, keeping our website up and running. Um, actually, though, the Strong and Healthy Start is on the AOE, the Age of Education website. That has been up for a couple of weeks and as is, and is effective as of November 16th, which was this week. The child care guidance is there and uh, that is all still, everything on it is good, but it's getting a little um, dated. So we have to work in getting that updated and freshened up and uh, congruent with the latest situation. So it's not as, um, I, I don't know, Sharon Lee, I, I, I know this is on the to-do list and we're working on it, but I don't think it's ready to roll out in any, in the next couple of days. We've gotten the latest, taking care of the latest cases. I think the uptick has, uh, and being clear with schools and the role of the school with um, helping families understand uh, what they need to do when they quarantine and being clear that the health department does um, contact tracing, both for you and the school. So that's the bulk of the work right now. Um, and I know several of you had questions about things that need to be updated. So um, we'll learn from you yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and quarantine, as you know, is um, for travel, is for anyone who travels out of state except for essential uh, work. Um, right. And the status on the disease outbreaks, this is linked to the overall health department um, data. So we did have questions about uh, very specific questions on um, data for childcare and data for schools. Um, we have the, what we collect is those who are positive and it indicates whether it's related to a school or childcare. Um, and the school information, as you know, is reported. Um, there's been requests to have the childcare data reported. Um, the most important thing with that is to remember that we're trying to protect and you want your names protected. So it's about protecting individuals while keeping the disease under control. Um, so and we can cover more of that um, as we go further. Um, the positivity rate, um, people have asked, what, how do you decide when to stay open, when to close in a state or in a broad population? Um, and Vermont doesn't really have a tool for that specifically because we've been so far under and we could still so far under um, any indicators that would suggest by the data or even the cases um, that things that child or school care um, should be closed. So uh, the link here is to the CDC decision-making tool. Those of you who want to explore that, you can. It's what CDC uses. We're not anywhere near um, at a point where it would be considered to be dangerous to be open. Schools and childcare are the safest places to be right now. Um, and asking for more updates, I think about contact tracing. I'm just looking at my notes here. I think we've covered this. Um, I will go to the next slide. So guidance and the third wave. Um, this, so our messaging this morning, whoops, excuse me. Um, that was about uh, data. So yes, we're in what looks like a, a third peak in data. The, um, we knew that child that cases would be occurring in schools and in childcare, um, but they have stayed fairly stable. And the upticks that you're seeing are primarily in the community. Um, Sally, did you want to speak to more of that? Uh I, yeah, I think we've talked about that a little bit, that, that these are community cases and then they become associated with a child care, right. such as a, a parent um, being exposed at, at a work site or a, um, a social gathering and they have children and the children are in your child care. That's how it kind of creeps in. 
but then, as you say, when the kids are in childcare, because you're doing what you're doing with distancing and washing hands and masking okay. and all, all of those time consuming um, risk reduction procedures, it doesn't spread um, readily within the childcare. I won't say that, that it doesn't, but I mean, there's always the potential, but um, it's really minimized because of the because the children are in a setting where um, the potential contagion is really controlled by the processes that you folks are working on. I just see some good news from our colleagues who have suggested that the airlines are booked for um, travel, meaning they can't book anymore. <laughs> So maybe there'll be some, because there's fewer spaces, maybe there'll be some less travel, we hope, um, but we'll get to that. These questions um, were really excellent. You guys provided great questions um, this time, as well as for time. And very specifically, um, the data that is kept, as I mentioned before, is the positive individual. So um, the AOE, the Agency of Ed, collects some data on school, classroom spaces that close and um, the uh, CDD, Department of Licensing for Child Care, collects some information on uh, child care and really tries to keep track of all the child care spaces that close or and reopen. So that's not data that we collect. Um, it's a great, would be great to know. And these are the papers that will occur later when the pandemic has begun to quiet down. Um, so that's just an update on that status. So this, you have to ignore this, uh, how to celebrate Thanksgiving um, and what to do about travel because we're, as you all know, we are discouraged um, from having other families in our homes unless you have you know, a loved one that is living alone and needs to have a, a special time during Thanksgiving, in which case all of those safety precautions occur. Um, and any travel uh, requires quarantine unless it's for truly essential purposes. Um, Dr. Levine says that, um, that if your Thanksgiving doesn't look different, then you might be doing something wrong. Um, so there's some suggestions for making Thanksgiving a little bit more, more safe. Um, even one idea came up, we used to call it a progressive supper, but you know, if you have folks that you're used to getting together with and they don't live too far away, you could make a dish, take half of it to them. They could make a dish, share half of it with you, you know, kind of share um, your food that way, leave it, uh, you know, outside so they can pick it up. And then um, later you can all sit down at the same time if you're gonna do your Zoom Thanksgiving. Um, if people do visit you, they need to quarantine at that place for 14 days. Um, they have an option to get a PCR test, as you know, on day seven, and their, their quarantine when their test results are returned. Um, but they, you need to make sure they have a separate space. You don't want to be sharing spaces and encouraging your families. And I know you're doing this. We, Sally and I know you're doing this because you really are the canaries that have brought all of the travel guidance um, to the forefront. We heard way back um, March, April, May from you that that was the concern and that's what made it to the governor's ear. Um, and remembering, you know, virus spreads among families and friends if they're close and eating without protections. Um, and it's okay to exclude families who travel. Um, we're not getting into, we, we know there's no specific guidance around, well, what if your families tell you that they spent the night over their best friend's house for three days and it's not a family that is a typical household member? Um, that's really an opportunity to educate and provide more reassurance and confirmation of what the you know masking, washing, staying safe distances when possible um, in uncrowded places. Um, okay, go forward. This stuff is damn hard. Um, having been there, I understand we're hearing you on the on the calls all the time. 
Um, these are some quick little ideas that came from the University um, Medical Center um, Pediatric Grand Rounds. Doctors Feldman and Wilcox adapted some resources. This link is to a resource that you're welcome to research. Um, but real, you know, some people talk about uh, meditating or deep breathing. I'm going to ask you all to take a deep breath. That's real great. But when you're really busy, um, you might not think you have time to all those things. These things are really quick. So reframing it, okay, you're with a bunch of people and um, what are some kind thoughts, some things that you're grateful for about the people that you're spending time with? It actually changes your brain to be able to see things that are positive that are occurring around you. We're so used to priming and thinking that we hear that what all the negative stuff we hear is really in the majority and it's actually a pattern that we've learned. We can relearn and pattern our brains to think with some of these thoughts. The two minute rule, that's a perfect example when your teenager's coming home or your spouse or your best friend um, and you're not visiting your best friend, but before you turn on your, your virtual meeting um, that you give two minutes undivided attention to that individual. Um, that you're planning to meet with. Um, and doorknob gratitude is, again, it's either before that meeting that maybe you're dreading or maybe a difficult conversation or um, a visit to the doctors for something kind of yucky um, <laughs> that you don't want to really have to talk about. You know, put your hand on that doorknob or be on that button and say, okay, what am I grateful for? What am I grateful for in that person that I'm going to see or in the opportunity that I have to experience? Um, it changes how your brain perceives and how your body responds to stress. To stress. It improves that um, your ability to cope. What do you do at the end of the day to take care of yourself? You know, it's really important. We hear from you day in and day out, and I feel the stress. I hear it. Um, and what we've realized is that some folks are so busy working so hard to do the right thing. And you're stuck between families, you're stuck between other people who are doing childcare and you hear different stories, it's hard. And if you are not making a space in your brain and your time for the day, you won't have the energy to take care of others. And we so appreciate what you're doing that taking care of you is crucial. So we can be quiet and open up to you. Some of these questions came in in advance. This is from the last one and I should take a deep breath before I go any further to see what's on the chat box. Well, and I, I was just combining a couple um, to, to ask that, go back to the travel that you were talking about. So there are several questions where folks are curious about, it's, I guess you'd call it more local travel. So they serve, they're in Vermont, but they serve families who live in New Hampshire. Um, they're in Vermont, they serve families who get uh, part of their care from, so like family and friend care mm -hmm. on the days that they're not coming to their program. Uh, and so how, how does one manage that well? Um, and yeah, so I guess speak to that if you would. So this, so the example would be um, you take care of a family whose children live in New Hampshire or New York, excuse me, and they are either talking about their travels elsewhere or their state has different guidelines. Um, we're asking that if families are telling you, um, the governor is asking you if People are traveling for leisure to places that are high disease. Um, they need to quarantine when they come back. If they're traveling to see you, they don't need to quarantine because you're doing care. Or if they're traveling, um, maybe they have to drive an hour to spend the weekend because it's their turn to take care of a grandparent or a mother. Um, that's allowed. And it's every opportunity is building your relationship with the family saying, you know, you are so important and everything you bring 
that you gather when you're out, you bring to us when you send your child. So we so appreciate your efforts to be safe. And so I just want to clarify, um, uh, it came up in three separate questions, that if a family lives in New Hampshire, but they're coming to my program in Vermont, mm -hmm. that it is okay for me to take them and just make mm -hmm. them aware of what Vermont's guidance is. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, because part of this is we want to keep children in child care. We want to keep that service for families to support the parents. Uh, but again, as they live in um, the community to see New Hampshire doesn't have a um, executive order like the governor put out last week. So we, if what Sharon Lee is saying to do a um, talk to the family and say, please be responsible. I, I don't want to use that term too much, but um, think about what you're doing when you're living in New Hampshire and avoid exposure, avoid social groups. Um, but yeah, because it's important to have the child in childcare. Um, yes, it's okay to come across the border. And then that leads to another question. So there is um, at least one program represented here today uh, who, has, who has kids enrolled whose families have people who work in schools where there were incidents and they are, the families are now um, uh, quarantining. So can the children of the teachers who are quarantining continue to attend? Um, can the children who attend a school with a positive attend? Absolutely. Um, so when um, you have been notified that you are a close contact, and we have some more resources on that further on, um, then you need to stay home. If you are the teacher working in a school and you've had a close contact with an adult known to be positive for COVID, you, the teacher, are staying home, but your children may attend childcare. Your spouse or partner may uh, go to work. And then this, gets, I think that, that it, it leads to another concern yeah. that's been raised, and that is what about asymptomatic um, carriers? So that is why, um, and that actually links to your, some other questions that came in too about uh, surveillance in schools. So um, again, first thing that you're always, you might wanna remember is you're always doing the daily screening. And schools now, you may know, are able to ask, um, have you traveled? And many of child cares have been asking this since March. Um, so, you're able to do screening right up front, contact, travel, symptoms, and those. that's the point when it's, a, it's okay to say, maybe you need to be home quarantining. Um, and I've lost track of my thoughts, so. Yeah, it's, the asymptomatic is, is right. it, it does make it tricky because many people are asymptomatic but would test positive if, if positive. Um, I think at a certain point we can't account for that um, unless Sharon Lee has a magic answer on that one. Um, well, the testing, the increase in testing. Yeah. Yes. So, but that's why when the people are in the childcare setting, you're doing all the hand washing and distancing and right. down and all because that will help minimize an exposure if the person is asymptomatic or thinks they just have a little head cold and hasn't really said they have symptoms and are in the childcare. And then that's the other reason why um, the health department's working with the community statewide to increase the testing and that in a, I think in another week or so, there's going to be um, public testing sites in every county. Mm -hmm. And the one way to capture going. to be asymptomatic and, and other folks is lots of contact tracing. We're increasing our contact tracing capacity and also capacity for testing. So those are two major tools right now that we're using statewide um, to get a hold of these, this increase in these cases. And then there are, thank you, there are examples of kids who have been tested, it comes back negative, but they still have runny noses and some congestion. Um, and so, um, can you talk about runny noses? Should any and all runny noses be excluded? Is there a difference between clear and boogery ones? Um, that's a direct quote, boogery ones. Um, and uh, in one case, a pediatrician approved 
a child after the negative test results, but um, the Vermont Department of Health on-call nurse advised uh, sending the child home. So mm -hmm. whose advice to take? Who's the final authority? So there, um, obviously we're always asking people to work and this, it sounds like in this particular case, it happened uh, closely with the physician or healthcare provider and the family. And uh, yeah, I think it's like, I saw in some of those questions, we talk about our th um, three and four times a week statewide meetings with pediatricians and Rena homes in the health department, trying to keep them all up to date. So I think we're doing a, a good job in working with the healthcare providers, but it's not a perfect communication. And yeah, all along we've had these instances where the, the prov I think, I think it happens, but we hear about it a lot because it's, it's a conundrum for you folks, so you call us, but I think there's a lot of times where it goes um, in an okay way. So the provider sends the child back, says they don't have COVID, they have a cold, and then you have to communicate back to the provider and say, well, they're not allowed in because they have a cold. You know, pretend there's no pandemic. We still don't want kids with runny noses in in our other symptoms in the childcare. So it, it can be frustrating. And and then yeah, I know sometimes you call us and we try to walk you through it. Uh, and we send that information back to Brina. She's constantly reminding her colleagues um, about the difference between runny nose and cold symptoms or symptoms of other diseases and then COVID. So uh, we're aware and I think we're constantly trying to message that. Uh, and then the other thing I've learned from Brina and Sharon Lee, you could, you might be a more of a clinical expert on this is that it doesn't matter quite so much the color of the mucus discharge, that sort of thing. It's like, it's there and uh, it doesn't, it, it, there's, there's no, you can't diagnose or tell an infectious period by the color of the discharge. So that's why we're just saying runny nose and um, improving, I think is, was one of the questions or, or resolved. And when I get calls like that, I say, you know, use your good judgment. Um, you, you know this kid, you've seen them in the last couple of days, is it really getting better or is it getting, and a lot of times you say, this is getting worse. And then you guys say, give me a great list of symptoms. And I'm like, oh, this person should have gone to nursing school. So uh, so you folks do know how to observe and assess these kids. You know them, you know what they're like when they're sick and when they're healthy. So that's a bit of a rambling answer. And Sharon Lee, I'll- Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. I have, will try to show it in the presentation mode. Okay, here we go. Um, you can see the slides. Yeah. 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 So the snot, um, that's one of my favorite questions um, because it's an old wives tale that I always believed up until a few years ago um, that the color depended on, uh, indicated the disease, the severity. The color actually indicates the phase of the illness. Um, and the, unless there's actually frank blood in it, um, it's not an indication of uh, bad things, but I know the question, and I apologize if Sally already covered this, um, it has more to do with, oops, has the child, um, is the child better? Do they eat well? Do they sleep well? Do they play well? Um, do they respond like they typically do, behave like they typically do? Um, and I know we had questions about, um, it may even, the questions might be, here, there were such good questions. Incidents where children are, were home due to symptoms and tested with negative results. Um, and when the family came back, the child came back, these symptoms were still present. If they really are continuing like they were when they left, if there's no change and the child appears ill, they need to be home despite what the test says. This is a hard message when you get different uh, communications from providers and um, other childcare providers and families, um, but we're, it is the consistent message that we're 
reinfor reinforcing with child, uh, child care providers, but with medical providers across the state. Now, not every child goes to a pediatrician or not every child goes to a, a medical provider who takes part in all of the activities now around prevention that um, COVID is the resources that are available to medical providers. So our local offices of local health, the uh, maternal and child health coordinator, so the public health nurse that works with medical providers in the community and the school nurse liaison that works in the school community, works with doctors and tries to uh, support partnerships with the childcare community and the school community. So it's a, it's a process of messaging and the culture change um, that takes time and it's painful, I know. Um, I, I wanted to uh, tack on a question here about safety and um, preventive care uh, and preventive practices. Um, there were a couple of questions about um, the, the messaging or that the message that people are hearing out in the public about um, disinfecting not being as effective as mask wearing and does that is that uh, and, and COVID not being easily, easily transmitted by on surfaces and uh, more of an aerosol transmission. Um, so does that mean that um, there will be any lower protocols for around disinfecting and all the um, uh, sterilization and disinfection processes that are currently being required of early childhood education programs? Such a great question. So I'm going to throw out the word Swiss cheese. And some of you have heard this analogy. Um, but you know, when you line up several layers of Swiss cheese and they all got holes in them, if you line up enough layers, there won't be any holes. And that is what all of these precautions are about. So cleaning three times a day, what a pain in the butt, I can't imagine. And when I used to chase kids around and I had a Kleenex clean one in one hand and a dirty snot pocket in the other hand, and I had to, you know, wipe a nose so many times that I had to wash my hands. I couldn't take care of a kid. That kid had to go home if I couldn't take care of others. The same thing with hand washing. Um, and it's just, and the washing around the, in the toilet, washing toys, um, washing doorknobs and railings in schools and things like that. It's How all about, Sorry. Oh, you're good at this. This is perfect. Keep doing this. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, how about outside outside toys and equipment? Um, you know, is that something with the cold weather onset, the fact that it's outside is, um, do we need to continue to clean and disinfect outdoor toys and play areas? So if they get rained on and sun shined on, uh, that's one layer of cleaning. And um, the school guidance um, took out, and this is probably one of the childcare guidance things that needs to change. So send us an email or call yeah. us and remind yeah. us. Um, no, you don't have to wash down the playground. Um, if kids are washing their hands before and after playground um, and before and after wishing on their face or changing masks, um, then they're good. Thank you. I think that's a welcome answer. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and, and in case people didn't catch it, Sharon Lee just said, email them to remind them that it needs to change. So um, the next couple, a couple of questions that have to do with updated guidance and um, sort of on the heels of that, like when will the, the guidance be updated um, and shared with programs? And then there was another one that I'm just gonna tap onto that. Um, is there something, is there sort of a one pager or a great link that programs can point their families to around Thanksgiving guidance? Um, other than say, you know, the, the official uh, governor's announcement and decree. Um, I think there is a one pager coming out and I'm sorry, but um, this link up here, the Thanksgiving guidance, uh, that's the CDC guidance. Um, and then this link here is the travel information around Thanksgiving um, specifically, but we can make sure that we get a clearer answer on a one pager about that. Yeah. Um, I, um, ton of I, social media stuff specifically yeah. for you. 
Yeah, for holidays, not necessarily yeah. for people who, who operate child cares, but there is stuff out. And I don't know if we can produce a, to be honest, Thanksgiving is next week and we're pretty swamped. I don't know if Sherry, you'll have time to put together something specific. So, you know, stay tuned, but I think Sherry just pointed out two good references. Yeah, yeah. One, um, of those are, one of the slides that was in here for the last time was the social media campaign which is, um, you know, keep masking, uh, keep distancing at six feet whenever possible. And it's really for adults if we're talking childcare providers and uncrowded places. Um, but we can, I think there's a specific guidance in the FAQ, but we can get that link to you. Well, and those links are really helpful. Thank you. Um, some families like to have a paper that they can tack up on the fridge um, or the yeah. side of a cabinet. And then, you know, sometimes it, um, some programs send home a newsletter that just has a paragraph or, uh, or they text um, or have their social media sites with those links. And I think those links are really useful. And they will be posted um, on the LGK website after okay. we're finished here today. So thank you for that. Okay, and I have the tool um, that's going to fix everything and get everything out there for you. Unfortunately, um, the magic wand has not been working too well, um, and the crystal ball is broken. So um, we don't have exact guidance for the child care document being updated. Um, I don't want to jump so, too far ahead, but contact tracing was a big one. Go ahead. Okay, so I have one other question related to yeah, the boogers. Yeah. Um, and that is, you mentioned that the color of snot indicates the phase of illness. And um, if you could do the thumbnail sketch of clarifying your statement, um, what do you mean by phases? And thank you. <laughs> You're so good at this. Thank you for condensing it. I get stuck in these rabbit holes occasionally. <clears throat> so I invite interruptions. Um, so clear is related to allergies and first stages of a cold. So that gives you two parts to decide. Is this a child with di uh, documented allergies or is the child looking sleepy and tired and miserable and the clear snot, which might be more viral? Um, so then you get into day two, three, four, when it gets a little yellow or green or day four, five, six, when it's green and stuck to their face. And, you know, you like looking for a washcloth to clean it off and whatever. Um, when the dirt gets all stuck all over and, you know, they've got to wash their hands because they're too little or they too busy playing. Um, that just means uh, you know, as long as they are well, eating, sleeping, playing, and behaving like they typically do, um, it just means the child is taking longer. I was one of those kids, I learned to blow my nose before I learned to walk. I have snot has been everywhere. It's a part of my life. So uh, it's medically managed. <laughs> but um, say some kids are just like that. Yeah, I, I, you know, there's one in, there's one comment in the Q&A about, you know, so kids can come back. So like you said earlier, we know these kids really well, and we know what improvement looks yeah. like um, for many of them. Um, so a child returns, they're wearing the mask, they have improved symptoms. Every time they sneeze, the inside of their mask is coated. Um, you know, the child care a provider, early childhood educator in me says, in the same way that we would have lots of backup spare clothes on hand, we should also have multiple masks available. Um, do, would you say more? Well, I think you take the prize because unfortunately I never had to deal, or fortunately I never had to deal with that. Um, yes, I would agree hundred percent. Having backups is good. And we went through questions around, should we launder in schools? Should schools launder the cloth masks? It never got resolved, but the uh, guidance for, again, you've done your daily screening. So you've ruled out travel, contact with disease, with, yeah, with COVID. Um, but if you're washing things in hot soapy water, that is the CDC guidance for washing uh, masks. So, putting it through 
the laundry, you know, don't use cool water, don't use the warm cycle, use hot. Um, and then the dryer, hot dryer. Just like for head lice. <laughs> <laughs> um, contact tracing, so much fun. How long should we expect the contact tracing process to take from all those in close contact and knowing what's inspected? So when you have a um, person in your program that is identified and is positive, that person should expect to hear within 24 to 48 hours. Um, as you know, there are more cases and we are uh, building up our, excuse me, I have to shut that one down, um, our contact tracing team and their work is getting more refined and more efficient. Um, so we're in the 24 to 48 hours, um, but they're, the people are staying home and they're minimizing infection transmission by staying home. Um, so close contacts, that is where schools and childcare, that's where the concept of, well, we know this teacher was in this classroom for four hours or eight hours. Um, and you're close, they're in your lap, you're hugging them, they're helping them with everything. Um, you're helping them get dressed. You might be outside a lot, but still. Um, so that would be, okay, that's the group that needs to stay home and quarantine. Um, and that when you are able to, because you know these folks so well, when you're able to say to that group, yep, this class is probably gonna need to be closed, uh, excuse me, for a couple days till we are real clear on who is the true close contact and that's what the health department does. Um, there's no specific answer. As you know, some people haven't been answering their phone. So that's why the governor and the commissioner have said, if you've been to these XYZ parties or skating rinks and you've not heard from us, please contact us. We want you to get tested. Um, so there are a lot of nuances to that question. Yeah. But that's um, the, where also you can call us on the on our yep. line here, the health department, because yep. um, we we're set up that we can answer and offer some initial guidance before you hear from the contact tracers. So, uh, and just also to mention, I, we may have talked that that we are hiring. We've hired this last week and this week new, uh, at least thirty new um, people have come in through various, like the National Guard is. Um, given us 20 troops to be trained as contact tracers and we've hired 10 temps and some other folks too. We're just pulling everybody in. So we have more contact tracing capacity and uh, because as we're saying that community wide testing and um, uh, contact tracing increased capacity are two major strategies that the governor and our commissioner wanna use to um, get this in, um, under control. This so, is Sarah, like, oh, yeah. Could you, um, could you ex explain to this group um, the difference in the extensions when they call in for weekends, after hours, oh, and calling during the day? Wonderful, perfect, Chris. Um, so uh, eight to three, that's Sally and my team. We also cover weekends, um, take turns. Um, Eight to three is the warm line. You can call and you call the number um, 863. <laughs> it's on the end of our thing, uh, yeah. 7240. Yeah. Yep. Um, extension five. If you call in the evening and a parent has called you and says, I am positive, but my child is not, um, then I would ask that you leave a message on extension five. If you get a call from a parent or a staff person and they say, my child is positive and he's been in your care or I at the staff am positive and I've been at work, um, call that number and um, it's extension three. 
um, or seven on the weekends, but three yeah. is where you should start. Yeah. Um, so if somebody's so available just, 24 seven. I think you just answered another one of the questions, um, which was around um, the why, why or how would it be okay for a child to attend care if someone in their house has been in close contact with someone with a positive COVID test and has to quarantine. So that child is obviously being exposed to this person um, and couldn't they bring it to the program? If the child is, if the parent or a family household member is positive, the child stays home, um, does not go to care. So perfect, thank you, Brenda. Um, and the contact, your program is the contact of the child. And so you are not at risk in that scenario. So this is where the question about HIPAA and transparency often comes up is um, sharing private information. So um, the fact that a child is staying home as a close contact, um, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable of having my whole neighborhood know that I was positive. I mean, I probably would tell them, but um, that I was positive for COVID. Um, and so my husband's gonna stay home because he's a close contact. We would just wanna stay home. But um, so my husband at his work, he wouldn't have to tell them why he was home. Is that helpful? Yeah. And I because you're not, at, if you're a close contact of a contact, you are not posing a risk and you are not contagious. So there's no need for you to do anything more beyond masking, distancing, and washing. It is helpful. It, it's hard to wrap our heads around. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think for all of us, um, it's hard to wrap our heads around all of the details. Um, and I thank you for going into that a bit um, because that is a concern. Um, yep. Yeah, thank you. So, and also, because you folks know to call us, if, if you have a case that's associated with your program and are trying to figure out how to talk to your families about that, give us a call. We can help you with the language. Exactly. You know, yes. to keep it HIPAA compliant. And as sometimes it's helpful to say to the families, we can't identify this person or some such language. And then as Sharon Lee was just saying, um, too, I think, um, if it was us who were positive, we would like, or our children, we'd like to know that that's being kept confidential so, and that other families will not be hearing about our, our medical conditions. So it, it goes both ways. And sometimes when you say that, then everybody's like, oh yeah, that's right. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, and then a question that's, um, so I guess we'll go from confidentiality to legal. Um, is it legal? to request a copy of a test result, um, whether positive or negative from a student um, or a staff member. Say I'm running a program and I have a staff member um, who gets tested and I legally request the result. So I don't think that there's any, This it's such a great question because people are trying to be safe and you're trying to be respectful and you don't wanna get in trouble. Um, there is no legal precedent in Vermont for um, mandating test results. Um, an example in schools and perhaps in childcare um, is a parent goes, so this is, goes back to the kiddos, kiddos that still have a lot of symptoms and they come to you and they say, well, the doctor said I'm fine and here's the negative test. Well, they went to um, across the border in Massachusetts, because maybe you live down in Bennington or Brattleboro, and they got a, a rapid antigen test, or they went to a place that does a rapid antigen test, and they just found a test and it said, I'm negative, um, but so I can come back to school or whatever. Um, it's, a, it's not inappropriate to say, well, Vermont uses the standard of PCR. So your child still has symptoms um, and you're saying the child is fine. I think we either need to see a PCR test or, but again, call us, yeah. call us in those scenarios because 
if the child, um, I'm trying to think where, um, maybe the child has been in contact with somebody or they still have symptoms and, and maybe they didn't see a provider, but they went to a, a rapid test place. Yeah. Um, we don't know what the true scenario is without the PCR test. Um, I, so we can walk that through that. That's true and that's a concern, I think, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. use that term of the PCR still being the, the best test available. Um, and, and a lot written about what we know now about accuracy of the rapid tests, new tests are coming, so this isn't gonna be with us forever, but um, yeah, give us a call on that or yeah. uh, and the, we can, if we don't know, we can ask. That chart, the red and yellow chart, um, it specifically says um, if a family doesn't, if an individual doesn't uh, choose to be tested or to see, seek medical advice, um, and they should be out for 10 days from the start of the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And if the 10 days, and this came up this last week, somebody went through the whole scenario and by the time they got on the phone, it was day 10 and the symptoms had result, were improved so they could come back because it had been 10 days since the start of symptoms and there was no contact and no travel, no contact with disease. Parallel question, if a parent is COVID confirmed and the child stays home, um, does the child stay out past, so the, the, the required amount of time past the parent's quarantine or, or it, if, is it the same amount of time um, if they're uh, negative? It's so great. Those are hard to be specific, but Assuming the child has no symptoms and assuming they have all quarantined, um, the child can be tested on day seven of the quarantine. Um, day zero is the day of exposure. So day seven, they can be tested out of quarantine. Um, and so another, uh, I think some of your comments about HIPAA and people's questions about um, why can't we know and why can't we tell, um, why can't you tell us? Um, the, here's one, um, a, a program director says, um, when anyone in our program child or staff has any symptoms of COVID, we share that information with parents through regular health update email. They have requested full transparency, but we do not divulge identifying information at all. Is it HIPAA compliant to share which classroom that child or teacher is in so the parents make more informed decisions about whether or not to keep their child home out of caution? Um, I think if you want to really, you know, manage the abundance of caution, I would say stay in bed, but that has a lot of dangerous side effects as well. Um, it's, and I don't mean to be flip because it's really hard. Um, when I was working in schools for those 18 years, if we had a situation where um, there was licensed school and somebody said, do you have licensed school? I would say, absolutely. 2% of kids have licensed every, all, of, all the time. So I will guarantee you that, um, you know, there's risks here and there. So by identifying a classroom, um, all somebody needs to do is see the other Facebook's posting or somebody else's social media or text and they put it all together and you can identify who that is. So we do, unless there's a true risk, um, you know, say you have a child with uh, rheumatoid arthritis or asthma and they're attending childcare and you really wanna know who's um, at risk. That's a private conversation with the, the director, the manager of the program and the teacher and the family and saying, um, yeah, there's risks to attending any public setting in the country right now. Um, we know that that case that you're asking about did not occur in your classroom. That, so there's other ways. We have some wonderful uh, epidemiologists that are do the case contract, contact tracing and just have such wonderful ways of explaining this. Um, there's other ways 
So you ask about identifying, okay, you got to find out who the teacher's been in contact with, but you don't, you can't tell the teacher who the child is. So the questions have to do with what kind of interactions do you have with the children in your program? Um, if you are the director, you may not have direct contact. Um, if you are in the classroom, but you only do the lunch meals, your contact will look very different than the person who's doing the diaper changes and doing the cleaning um, and holding kids and read, you know, reading stories, holding kids in your lap. So there are ways to be creative around asking questions or sharing information. Is that helpful at all? Um, I'm sure that it is helpful to so, some, you know, it's so interesting. There are so many questions that intersect yeah. and I'm just recognizing that the time is 159. Yeah. Um, so uh, I wondered if you had any more slides that you wanted to share information and so we can yeah. um, help people to let people get on with their day. Yeah, I'll just point out this. Um, if you haven't seen this, this explains exactly what the health department does and why, what contact tracing looks like. Um, this next one, um, temperature checks are inside now or sheltered spaces, you have to be creative. Um, funding, uh, this is a let's grow kids question. We need advocacy to, to um, find funding for ventilation. It's not about fixing anything, it's about improving things. Um, there's surveillance, what we were talking about is surveillance is not the same as um, testing if you get sick. Um, these are very good, uh, this, here's an example, this is what it looks like. These um, visuals, so that if you are close contact, this is what your timeline might look like. If you have symptoms at any time you see your provider. Um, and this is a thank you from the American Academy of Pediatrics of Vermont. That press release came out, maybe Let's Grow Kids wants to post it. It is for schools, but all those people that spoke were speaking for childcare, I know. Take care of your mental health, it's so important. And this is our contact information. And then the last slide is the dates for the next meeting. Sorry for going over. Um, well, and part of my job is to, is to um, pay attention to the time and I completely perfect lost it. So I, I apologize to everyone. I know see some people had to drop off. Um, I'm just going to um, say thank you so much, both of you, Sally and Sharon Lee, for spending some time with our questions and for seeing our questions today. And thank you for being available. Um, again, everyone who's participated, if you're still on, the, the contacts um, will be posted on um, this whole slide deck will be posted on Let's Grow Kids website. And um, I know that the Department of Health does welcome your questions. Chris, did you have any parting thoughts? We really appreciate everyone's participation today. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking your time. Sally? Thank you. This is great. And we'll do it again in a couple of weeks. And hope we have better news about daily case counts. And you are taking care of the next generation of Vermonters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much.